what would your advice be to folks in their PhD programs that are listening right now, folks in undergrad that are listening right now, people that are wanting to start companies? You had mentioned a call to arms on our, on our early calls, so maybe you could, uh, uh, I'll give you the floor. The key is just to be really ruthless about how you spend your time and what you work on and not waste time on stuff that um, doesn't fit sort of the metrics of, um, of the kind of the success you're looking for, the kind of organization that you want. Welcome to Benchling's Founders Chat, where we learn how top biotech founders are shaping the future of life sciences in this monthly series, which is sponsored by Quartzy. I'm your host, Sean McCormack, and I lead Emerging Professional Services and Industry Solutions here at Benchling. This month, it is my pleasure to be joined by Dr. David Nels. David completed his PhD in Materials Engineering at the University of California, San Diego, where he pioneered the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for targeting RNA. He went on to become the co-founder and CTO of Locana Bio, a very successful series B biotech uh, based on his work in RNA editing using CRISPR systems. More recently, Dave has left Locana and is now the founder, CEO, and chief scientist of a second stealth mode biotech. David has, of course, had a very successful career to date, and we are excited to learn from today about his two-time founding journey. Welcome, David. It's great to have you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Benchling for putting on this, uh, this series uh, with any luck. Um, what I have to offer today will be useful to anyone who's interested in transitioning from academia to the world of startups. I think we're in a golden age of biology. There's a lot of really exciting stuff uh, going on and a lot more to be done. And I think I love this like space race analogy where there were many technologies that were invented that are now like kind of fundamental to how we interact with the world from uh, solar panels and, and otherwise. And I think in the world of biology, there's opportunities more so than previously to find sort of incremental solutions. I think when solar panels were being made, it wasn't entirely clear what they would be used for beyond use in space. Their efficiency was too low, but you know, kind of that initial push got them to the point where they're ubiquitous and a significant fraction of the power that we use in the world today. And I think biology is um, in, a, in a phase whereby there are really clear proximal uses of uh, technologies that eventually will allow us to have profound control over biological systems. But in the meantime, there are many, many problems that are worth addressing that, um, that are related to human health, that are related to, you know, industrial use of, uh, you know, metabolic materials and other exciting stuff. So I think there's opportunities for young people um, with any sort of scientific background to get into this world and leverage the power of capitalism to build cool stuff. So hopefully this will be useful to anybody interested in making that sort of transition. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it certainly will. Um, you know, maybe this is a good transition to where we can start, which is I think the science, you know, we're going to talk about about you find founding two companies. Uh, we're going to talk about that journey, but um, it sort of all starts with with having uh, some scientific principles behind them. And so in, in your PhD, you were using CRISPR Cas9 to target RNA. Um, Locana kind of went on to do something very similar to that. Um, I think your newest company is also working in RNA. And, and I think the audience, if they weren't kind of familiar with RNA therapeutics over the last decade and where that was advancing, um, have certainly become more familiar with with things like Moderna and mRNA over the course of, of the pandemic. So maybe the question here is like, why RNA? Why is RNA really exciting? Can you tell us more about um, kind of the specific work that you're doing? Yes. So the field of RNA has been growing quickly. And as an engineer, I've always been excited about uh, addressing RNA from a technological perspective. So in 2009, I started my PhD and the idea was cells contain uh, different RNAs, depending on the state of the cell, the type of cell, whether it's disease or healthy, circadian rhythm, what have you. So it provides a really convenient handle for recognizing specific cell states, diseased or healthy. And if you could use that as a basis to recognize cells, to manipulate cells, to do other things, you could come up with highly targeted therapeutics to address human disease. You can come up with ways to assess disease or health or other features of biology in, in ways that at that time were, were not really addressable. So I started my work uh, again, in 2009, at the beginning of my PhD at UCSD, focused on building polymeric systems to recognize RNA. And then um, there's also some, a lot of really exciting work involving protein-based systems. And it was always sort of on our mind, how do we make a really flexible, convenient, programmable way to recognize RNA? And so the work describing targeting DNA with CRISPR in 2013, that sort of spurred us to think really carefully about how we could repurpose CRISPR-Cas9 to target RNA. And so shortly after that, we quickly linked up with the Doudna lab, published a paper, and then continued building this new version of CRISPR-Cas9 to target RNA. And since then, there have been hundreds, maybe thousands of obligate RNA-targeting CRISPR proteins that have been 
discovered and in some cases reduced to technological applications and eventually into human therapeutics. And that includes what's going on at uh, Wakana Bio, that last company I formed. So the field has been moving really quickly and I'm really excited about the future of this area. Um, one, one profound problem that uh, the entire field is facing, whether it's RNA targeting, DNA targeting, pretty much any nucleic acid targeting approach um, that is compatible with a gene therapy vector is this problem of immunogenicity. So the presence of uh, immunogenic proteins, whether they're bacterial or engineered or otherwise, can cause problems uh, in human cells, adaptive immunity, which can result in either clearance of the cells that have been treated or destruction of the therapeutic itself, both of which could be um, as bad or worse than the disease itself. Um, th those issues are profound. So I'm really excited about approaches that involve repurposing components that are already present in cells. So there's a company called Shape Therapeutics, ADARX, a couple others that repurpose uh, the ADAR enzyme, which is present in human cells already and uses that as a basis to uh, generate specific edits in cells. So my current company is sort of in a similar world in that we repurpose enzymes that are present in cells already in order to avoid uh, using uh, exogenous enzymes like CRISPR proteins, which could be immunogenic. And in that way, we can sort of, I kind of, I kind of like this Apollo 13 analogy I was telling you about earlier. Yeah, yeah. So the oxygen scrubber or what have you broke uh, in, in the command module and they had to figure out with the components that are present uh, inside the command module, how to how to save their lives, how to, how to you know make this fix um, with the help of, of Houston, you know, over the radio. So the idea is like we're Houston, but we have an opportunity to put a couple things in the command module before it goes to solve, you know, potentially lethal problems um, from a distance by using components that are already present uh, in the cell. So that's sort of the inspiration of what we do. And when it comes down to the details, I won't be talking about that much today, but I, I am excited about sort of this overall philosophy, repurpose cellular components. Yeah, I know. It's really exciting. Maybe if I could just like summarize that back for the audience. I, I think what you're saying is that, you know, in your early work, you were working on CRISPR-Cas9 for RNA. Um, there's kind of an inherent problem with CRISPR where the, the Cas nuclease is an enzyme that's sort of recognized as foreign uh, by the body. And so uh, rather than kind of proceed on that path with, with this new stealth company that you're forming, um, you're working on uh, using components within the cells uh, that aren't the, the Cas nuclease to, to do your do your work for you and, and do the editing or uh, is, is that a, a fair summary? I think it is. Yes, it is indeed. Awesome. Okay. So uh, very exciting. Um, I think what I wanted to talk about next is sort of just, uh, you know, you're in your PhD program. A lot of the folks, I guess, on this call are, are either aspiring founders, founders, um, maybe they're working in their PhDs right now and, and, you know, want to go on the journey that you've been on. So can you talk a little bit about sort of your journey from, I have a great idea. I'm, I'm writing some papers during my PhD to, uh, you know, I'm a co-founder of Locana Bio. Yes. Um, so I started my PhD with sort of the plan from the outset to try to build something that could form the basis for a platform, a technology platform that capitalism would appreciate. So something that we could raise money around, something that we could conceivably build products uh, and, and address real human problems. And therapeutics is a really exciting area just because there's a huge amount of resources available to solve really difficult problems. And sort of the scale of it and the excitement and kind of the importance of the problems really motivated me. So. The idea was to build some sort of RNA targeting system and use that as a basis to to address disease from the beginning. Um, that said, that path is you know winding, and um, you know, we doubled back frequently. And um, the net result was you know many many failed projects throughout my PhD. I think yeah. around my third or fourth, I think it's maybe mid fourth year, I was like, oh no, I need to figure out like something that I can do a thesis on because I dropped so many projects that like kind of worked, but like weren't quite at the level that I thought would be necessary to go out and be able to raise money post-grad, you know, yeah, and absolutely. these things I didn't feel like I could in good faith do that. So I started working on this CRISPR project and things sort of just took off from there. Um, we sort of showed up at the right time. Um, we were iterating really rapidly on different, different problems. And, and that was the problem among and, and solutions. And that was sort of the solution that, um, our efforts converged on when it came to kind of the models that we had available, the problems we wanted to solve, and also sort of the credibility that we had in the world of RNA. It all kind of converged on this, this area. And so once we started work, once we started getting some recognition for the work, getting the work in good journals, it was actually relatively easy uh, at that time. And I think it's even easier these days to get the attention of the relevant parties. We, so I founded this company with my thesis advisor, Gene Yeo, in 2016, when I was still a graduate student. 
and it was it wasn't um i think especially these days i think if you have a good idea i think vcs are much more savvy these days about looking at work that's going on um in in academia and you know sometimes contacting people after paper papers come out um helping organizations and individuals figure out how to reduce a finding into a technological solution in the company so there's a lot of um, smart people out there with resources who are interested in kind of aiding in that transition um so so anyway that's i, th I think these days it's sort of um if you, if you really ruthlessly focus on problems that are unsolved problems that you have a unique angle on i think it's it's very much possible to kind of draw on the support you need and and um yeah i think yeah I think I think still maybe a little unclear for me, like how how do you know when this idea is ready for prime time? You have all these failed projects, but maybe like the, the the answer is right around the corner in some of those. And so you get to this new one. Is it because there was VC interest? It was because the paper that you published was successful. Like what was like the impetus that that really drove? Let's go make this company. I think um, a really good thing to do is work backwards. You know, the TPP target product profile is something mm. people love talking about, but um, you know, it's, it's there's definitely something to it. And we had to really carefully focus on, you know, what, what problems remain unsolved, what problems do we think we have a good angle on, and then sort of what are the incremental bits of data that we could use to convince ourselves and others that our solution is actually on the path towards, you know, filling this gap. So in the case of Lacana Bio, we were focused on repeat expansion disorders, and there simply were not any credible means to uh, destroy these repetitive RNAs mm -hmm. um, that cause myotonic dystrophies, Huntington's disease, familial ALS, that are compatible with the gene therapy vector. So if, if you want durable and persistent reversal of disease, you really want to work with, with a gene therapy vector, at least that was the case at the time, Prefer preferably a viral one. Yeah. So um, it was clear to us that if we can achieve this, then um, there will be interest, there will be support available. And once we collected kind of the requisite data in tissue culture and then eventually in a mouse, um, we we believed that um, this is something that at the very least we'd have um, a handful of products to you know to extract from this technology platform, if not many more. And indeed, that's what motivated us to, to carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't want to gloss over the Locana story here because there's a lot that happened in I think those those five or so years that you were working on that project. But maybe if you could just talk us through um, sort of what was the the most challenging part of that journey. And and for the audience here, uh, Locana raised a hundred million dollars Series B uh, in 2020. Um, I think, David, you left shortly after that. So um, kind of just talk us through what you learned, uh, how you grew that company, and, and what was exciting. Yeah, the major challenges happened sort of sequentially. Uh, I guess the biggest challenge was addressing what you brought up earlier, which is, you know, what is worth building a company around? And yeah. I think the many, many ideas that were good in principle that generated some positive data, you know, walking away from those approaches um, when it became clear that the gaps were either problems that were not meant to solve that won't be solved for a long time that we can't raise the resources to solve but, you know once once it became clear those gaps were sort of insurmountable and or maybe the kind of how things were landing just wasn't quite at the level we hoped it to be like walking away is really tough but then once we had some momentum and we had an angle um i think the major challenges became kind of switching from like an academic mindset about how we view the quality of our work and adjusting how we ask questions you know shifting yeah. from how do we convince the editor that this is publishable to how do we convince a business person, a venture capitalist, a potential pharma partner, that this is something that will work when you put it in human beings. And the problems that people are worried about when it comes to clinical translation are very different. And it's you know very much about safety. It's very much about predictability. You might have something that um, works really well in principle, but if there's no way to predict from patient to patient um, how well it will work, suddenly you can't design a clinical trial and suddenly you don't have a viable business. So yeah. shifting the thinking towards kind of like an indication focused analysis from which you work backwards rather than, you know, the classic engineers, you've got a hammer, you know, which which nail do you do you find to, to swing at? Um, that transition, I think, was was a really important one to make. And, you know, I'm speaking in generalizations right now, but um, I can maybe talk later about kind of specific to my field and specific to gene therapy type of problems that um, that these general philosophies kind of converge on. Yeah, totally. I think I think one thing that's kind of interesting, and it probably applies to both Locana and to this new stealth company that you're founding. Um, what are like the early milestones when you when you have one person or two people and you're trying to figure out what does the first year look like? How do you kind of orient yourself towards towards a goal in that first that founding moment? 
Yeah, I think the challenge of the early time, like the first couple of years, first two or three years, is taking you know extremely limited resources and using that to address the problems that can make or break your operation in the eyes of yourself, to convince yourself, but also to convince future partners, future investors. So being truly ruthless about how you spend your time, not wasting a moment on anything that is not directly linked to that, you know, that de-risking process. And then after the Series A, then you can kind of take a step back and figure, okay, let's let's make sure we have empirical evidence for pretty much everything that's relevant to the development of our technology. Like before that, it's more like, what are the things that'll make or break this? And then how do I address them as well as I can in a credible way? And then have solid arguments as to how more resources or partners or what have you will allow us to address yeah, the other yeah. gaps as they arise. So um, for us, we, we collected um, a bunch of data demonstrating safety and also efficacy in mouse models during the seed round at Locana Bio. So that work is published, uh, it, I think, uh, in, in late 2020, uh, 2019, maybe. Yeah. And we reversed uh, myotonic dystrophy in a mouse, which is really exciting because this is a muscular dystrophy that mice have this really overt phenotype, um, this behavioral physiological phenomenon that's kind of replicates sort of what happens in a human being. And to see these mice go from profoundly dysfunctional to what appeared to be indistinguishable from healthy mice huh. where, you know, even if we, you know, we see all this transcriptomic data, we see all this high dimensional data that tells us it's working, but to see this mouse um, gives you kind of this emotional uh, basis to, um, to get out there and, and raise money. And I think when we showed it to the members of our board and outside investors, it was really clear that uh, what we had created there, there was something to it. Um, and it very much is an emotional decision to, you know, to, to take a risk on an early stage company. And um, that, those bits of data, uh, I mean, every, everything has to be buttoned up nicely, but like what can convinces somebody to write a check and, and take a risk in, you know, in a risky area. Um, it's, it's those kind of uh, bits of data that really demonstrate things in a visceral way that truly make a difference. Yeah, totally. It's fascinating. It's probably really emotional. You can totally see kind of the result of the work there with with a mouse going from sort of some disease model to sort of a healthy animal, um, which is quite amazing. Um, so you leave Locana. Can we talk a little bit about maybe the decision to go and sort of what you did in the time between that and and, and now? Because I think you talked to me a little bit about, um, you know, during the pandemic going off into the wilderness uh, is, is, is to use your words and, and sort of thinking about new ideas. So um, maybe talk me through that time and um, how you came up with the next idea. Yeah, I mean, I think the most relevant things to describe for a general audience are kind of the natural transition of a biotech startup from um, you know building the technology platform, assessing its breadth and utility during the seed round, and then you maybe the early Series A, and then quickly after that, shifting towards more of a product-focused organization. So having kind of pumped in all the technology, and um, direction when it came to the technology uh, and you know overall strategy, ha having kind of put that into the company, um, raised a Series A, became clear that um, I could either spend a couple more years, learn kind of the the nitty gritty of, of uh, preclinical developments. So I, I learned a lot of that, but you know there's there's a lot more that needed to be done, and I think the team over there is killing it as far as I can tell from over here. Yeah, um, and so it became clear that if I wanted to build new technology platforms from the ground up. Um, I probably could continue doing it, but I could also just step away and um, just do it in a separate organization. Indeed, if you have a technology platform, um, it, the best way to build a company is with one. So um, I figured I was going to come around to building a new technology platform. I wasn't really sure what it would be. wasn't really sure when it would happen, but I quit in January of 2020, right before the pandemic struck and with the intention of going on a nice long vacation, but instead- Bad I, timing, David. I ended up sort of in exile for a while, but it was, it was, a, it was a pleasant time overall. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I count my lucky stars that it worked out as well as it did. Um, yeah, I guess it's not obvious to me how you would sort of, you know, go on a, a long extended pandemic vacation and then come up with this new idea. Like in, in your PhD, you were working on on all these things. You had these failed projects. You, you come across CRISPR-Cas9 for RNA and kind of make that work. Um, how did you- sort of think of this new idea in, in your time off or I think your time in Europe, actually. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm motivated by the gratification that comes from like seeing a, uh, an organization coalesce on an idea and on a principle. I think it's really exciting. Capitalism is kind of this relatively unique way where huge groups of human beings, tens, hundreds or thousands, even more can cooperate to solve a problem together 
without any coercion involved, which is kind of unique in human history, right? Yeah. So I was really motivated by kind of leveraging that. And when it came to kind of the idea process, um, I first I try to maintain a high level of ignorance. Like I don't read anything. I don't get into the literature. Like the early stages are like, well, how should things look like, you know, and, and I just try to stretch my imagination as much as possible. What would be the best case scenario in terms of our ability to manipulate mm -hmm. anything like we should be able to take a remote control point, you know, uh, take some electromagnetic radiation pointed at the human body that should activate something that's engineered in there. And that should give us a basis to reverse any, you know, biological phenomenon we want. Right. So let's yeah. work backwards from there. Like, what are the things that we have? What are the things that we don't have until we converge on something, at least in my head, that, um, you know, is, is proximal enough so that there's maybe a couple gaps and then and then from there i get into the literature and i think okay we need a protein that does this we need a delivery system that does that and then i begin to try to figure out like how the gaps might be filled and eventually with any luck the gaps will be reduced to something that you can solve with a couple million dollars or at least conceivably solve a couple million dollars but that that process is you know it's it's a tough process but given some months uh to think and uh some quiet time early pandemic um, I had a lot of fun, and uh, and here we are now in JLab South San Francisco, grinding through uh, this new platform. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, you know, starting with like this most optimal future and sort of working backwards. I guess at some point you had to go from I've thought about this a lot, I've, I've read the literature, and I need like a, a pipette in hand and a lab bench. So um, what was that transition? Was it just you? I guess a year ago now uh, working on this, or um, what did that look like? Yeah, it was it was me in J Labs um, with a pipette. So before, so I went out and I raised um, some money from friends and family, and that's not something I'd done before. Yeah. But now that I have an angle, now now that I had an angle, sort of on what the early stage grind looks like, I had enough of a reputation that I figured if I can get the science to work, I will definitely be able to go out and raise more money. Um, I felt comfortable to go to non professional investors. Uh, people could lose the money, but are you know kind of. Uh, not excited. They have to be doing well enough in the stock market that you know, things were really well for a couple of years yeah. um, that, that they could, you know, they wanted to engage some more risky investments. So being really clear about the risks of biotech, kind of the binary outcomes, but also giving a really detailed plan about what I think will work, what our challenges will be and how long it might take being just really intensely sober about it. I felt, I felt comfortable taking money from, from, from friends and family. And um, I've used that money to mostly do bench top experiments. Um, so I found space in J Lab South San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Started work the first couple of months. I just tested all of my favorite hypotheses to that were focused on those gaps that I mentioned. Yeah, I identified in kind of my um, thought experiment process. And once once I found a set of experiments and a set of kind of a framework, um, and, that, and, and also assays that allowed us to quickly compare different versions of this this new principle we developed, uh, I went out and uh, found a really talented scientist named Dennis. And, um, and we started working together. And I've been sort of extracting myself from, from the lab almost entirely at this point. But uh, it all started with friends and family money and yeah. my pets. How much, how much runway were you thinking you needed to, to kind of get this thing off the ground? How much time did you give yourself? Yeah, so at the beginning, um, I, think we, I think we raised enough money to keep us going for about 18 months tops, but preferably... Okay. The idea was, you know, get some good data and then move a bit faster, spend more money, maybe operate for about a year. Yeah. Um, we also got an NSF grant, an SBIR grant, and we also closed a partnership deal, which allowed us to kind of propel the, the platform um, yeah. in, in, in another direction. So those three different sources of funding extended our runway and allowed us to you know, really quickly um, collect data to support this new idea. When you when you negotiated that partnership, did you was I, I think sometimes people get into partnerships and then the sort of direction of what they're doing changes to fulfill that partnership. How did, is that sort of something that you were thinking about when you were, when you were getting into that deal? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's important to view partnerships sort of as, you know, especially this early stage, like a knowledge exchange and, you know, a close collaboration. And sometimes partnership is like, let's evaluate what you have and figure out if it works in our hands. This partnership is very much, you know, it's an earlier stage type of thing where we are trying to figure out together if what we can accomplish, um, if, if, if we can enter new indication areas that are otherwise inaccessible to everyone. Yeah. Um, and, but in principle, our platform should work, should work yeah. well. So it was very much an, like kind of a co-exploration type of uh, motivation. 
Um, you mentioned J Labs a few times here. I know Locana was was also in the San Diego J Labs, and now you're up in the South San Francisco J Labs. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know why you've chose to do that twice? I think a lot of the the folks on the call who are thinking about founding companies um, probably want to figure out the most you know expedited way to do so, um, and, and maybe talk through um, that decision process and what what it offered for you. Yeah, I mean, I was a lab rat for years in graduate school and during a short postdoc, and um, also at Locana for a bit. So when I walk into J Labs facilities anywhere, they have all the equipment you need to test all of my favorite ideas. It's very much uh, built out for therapeutics yeah. and molecular biology and cell biology in a way that you can just show up and you know really quickly start collecting data, which is critical because every month spent getting a feel for the local environment is you know a significant amount of money that's that's been burned. So um, so it was it was a clear. Uh, I had a great experience in JLabs San Diego, and I think now that we're in San Francisco, JLabs SSF um, also also has a great view. So yeah, great yeah. Um, let's talk about hiring. You, you said you hired Dennis. Um, how have you like? How, how do you go about finding that that first hire? Um, kind of what are you looking for? And then I know you've talked a little bit about um, your your second hire being potentially a a, a robot. Um, and, and so I want to know about like sort of how you leverage the resources at hand to uh, get the most work done. Yes. Um, so I think when it comes to initial hires, um, it's really important um, to have to be extremely smart to just as importantly, be extremely flexible. So kind of the, I mean, the classic analogy is we're building the plane as we fly it. So yep. assessing the experiments we're conducting every single day, being really careful about the assumptions we're making, testing assumptions ruthlessly, um, making sure that we're designing experiments in a way that will tell us all the different ways things won't work as they do tell us simultaneously how they will work is, is critically important. And that's sort of intellectual flexibility to kind of build a model in your head of how it could be working in all the ways it might appear to be working, but it's actually not. That type of flexibility, I think, is sort of innate and can be learned, but, um, but it's definitely something that some people are more predisposed to than others. Um, and then Simultaneously, automation has been a really yeah. convenient way to speed things up. There are lots of companies these days that sell cheap robots, and there's also lots of uh, used robots you can get at eBay. Sometimes they work. So it, it's a great way to speed up what you're doing. There's always this tension between conducting assays that are relevant, but at the same time quick. Um, yeah. Frequently, there's a you know, trade-off between, between the two. So designing uh, assays that are scalable, compatible with automation, but then quickly following things up in a way that will truly reveal what's going on in, in detail is, is a really important part of the process. And we've taken advantage of screening of all sorts and automation uh, using this Eppendorf robot that we have to, to speed things up. And that's been instrumental to getting uh, enough work done uh, in this short, this short time since we um, started. Yeah, I don't think it's obvious. Uh, it wasn't obvious to me when I sort of got into the industry and maybe to a lot of people on the call that like two folks and a robot can kind of be a, an existing way to run a lab right now. Did you have to have a bunch of automation experience? Um, did you have that from Locana? Did Dennis have that? How did you sort of get that all set up? Was it just easy? The Eppendorf robots, uh, I think, have a very simple interface. It's kind of a visual interface. And the way it pipettes is similar to how a human pipettes. I think some systems are both faster, but also uh, more complicated and less intuitive. So I think it was relatively easy to figure out how to use this. Um, and, I, and I think some of the faster robots that have like more independently articulated uh, pipetting heads, some of those are, are you know kind of tougher to program, but uh, also faster. But we wanted something that was pretty pretty straightforward. So I had some automation experience before we we started doing this work, but I learned kind of most of my practical uh, you know skills. Uh, here as we, as we built this company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so are you raising a series A now? Is that, is that sort of the, the next stage? We are stealth stealth. So I will just plead the fifth amendment on that <laughs> one. And um, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about just sort of your observations in, in the markets and the biotech markets, what you're really excited about um, and any reservations you have made over the next few years. Um, what interests you, I guess? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm really excited about um, you know durable, inherently safe, inherently non-immunogenic ways to address human disease. And you know, antisense is a classic means to do this. They have their own issues when it comes to toxicity, which is largely unpredictable. But we're getting better at it. Um, I can think of some specific people who are getting better at it, actually. Um, but you know, protein-based systems have so much uh, 
you know, potential activity built into them. You know, they're, they're the nano machines of the cell. And if you can use those while not uh, dealing with the immunogenicity problem, I think that's kind of the, the holy grail at the moment, at least. Um, so, so I'm really excited about any means to kind of repurpose machinery in the cell that is already present. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited about kind of more flexible and durable ways to uh, deliver material to human cells. I mean, the problem of delivery is persistent. The good news is for individuals who develop modalities, even now there are many tissues that are addressable with existing delivery technologies yeah. uh, for which there lack, for which there don't exist um, means to address those, those molecular dysfunctions. So sooner or later we'll have exhausted um, all of the different uh, diseases that exist in addressable tissues with existing delivery modalities, but we're not there yet. And uh, hopefully the delivery people will figure it out. I'm super excited about the field of delivery and I've got some ideas that are sort of marinating, but I think RNA editing is currently my, my favorite place to operate for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you think uh, sort of biotech changes, you know, over the next few decades, I think looking backwards, you see some of these big companies are in South San Francisco. So Genentech or Regeneron in New York, these massive organizations with really big pipelines that just churn out new therapeutics. Um, and I think now uh, we see, you know, folks using web-based systems like Benchlane to record their data. We see uh, people using CROs. We see a lot of partnerships. Is there going to be a different way that these sort of ecosystems exist in the future? Or do you think it's still going to be these big companies? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're still in sort of in the cottage industry phase of yeah. biotech. And I think, so uh, I think it was like a quotation out of flagship where um, someone said that uh, biotechnology and entrepreneurship these days is like medicine in the 18th century. You know, if, if you're a surgeon and 49 of your patients die, but one survives, like you're a genius, you're the best surgeon in your, in your hemisphere. And biotech is like similar. You know, if you have one success among many failures, you know, inscrutable, inexplicable failures, um, yeah. then you're good at it, which is which is kind of funny. But um, medicine these days has been institutionalized. And if one of your patients dies on the table, then people tend to pay attention. So it provides an opportunity to for individuals to you know show up and create organizations, solve problems. I mean, they're either they're quickly coalescing into bigger organizations. You know, the Googles and the Facebooks of biotech are probably being formed right now. Yeah. And um, maybe maybe in the next 10 years. So what do they look like? Um, remains to be seen. I'm super excited to see what happens. But I love kind of re returning to this analogy of like a remote control that can influence uh, the behavior of human tissue or individual cells. There's a company out there called, I think it's B Bio. They have B cells. Yeah. Um, you can use to, yeah, they, they're basically like protein therapeutic biologic factories that you can place anywhere in the body and activate them at will. So rather than infusing enzymes, you can have cells that produce enzymes in situ, maybe even autologous cells. So they're not going to be viewed in an unfriendly way by the adaptive immune system. So this idea of like creating cells that will float around the body, solve problems at will, like a Swiss army knife um, engineered cell system that can show up and, you know, be activated remotely. <laughs> To repair tissue or release a drug or release a biologic or what have you. These are all things that you know are very much within range of what happens normally in, in human bodies. But the idea is to kind of coalesce these different phenomena into a single engineered system and then add some sort of external handle to, to make that possible. I think that's that's within range of what we can do this century. And um, I'm super excited to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think I am. I think we all are, are pretty excited. Definitely the, the group eventually is. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, because as you just mentioned it, um, is sort of about failure. I think there's a lot of conversation about, you know, do we publish failures in biotech and in like basic research enough? Um, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, nobody wants to talk about the 49 patients that died on the table, but yeah. we want to believe in that conquering hero um, uh, story around around scientists and, and entrepreneurs. So, um, yeah, I think now that there's sort of more support available and maybe i think there'll be kind of like an inverse correlation between the amount of magic that needs to be perceived in a fundable organization against the you know the aversion to talking about failure i think kind of as one of those increases the other will decrease um and i think because if you know you don't need that sense of uh that sense of magic to get funded then suddenly yeah. you can talk about your failure so it's good it's good for everybody when things talk about things that don't work and um i think it's happening slowly as uh biotech becomes an early stage biotech becomes more, you know, bureaucratized, institutionalized, becomes more of a rote process than it used to be. That has its own, you know, kind of loss of romance, which, which is unfortunate, but 
it's better for humanity in general, I think. Yeah, totally. Um, maybe the last thing we have, a, we have a, a two truths and a lie section coming up. But before we talk about that, I know you mentioned it briefly in the beginning, but um, what would your advice be to folks in their PhD programs that are listening right now, folks in undergrad that are listening right now, people that are wanting to start companies? Like, what it, you had mentioned a call to arms on our, on our early call. So maybe you could, uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Sure. Um, fellow scientists. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, there's a huge amount of um, resources out there these days, especially after the markets were so hot and a lot of uh, a lot of VC funds with swollen bank accounts trying to spend money. And that won't last forever, but, you know, it goes in cycles. But I think there'll be, you know, a continuous swell of excitement about biotech. And, you know, for young scientists interested in seeing their ideas reduced into actual physical objects that are solving real human problems, I think there's just a huge amount of resources available, which I guess is obvious to everyone. So the key is just to be really ruthless about how you spend your time and what you work on and not waste time on stuff that um, doesn't fit sort of the metrics of, um, of the kind of the success you're looking for, the kind of organization that you want, because there's real yeah. hard barriers towards creating an organization in, outside of the world of academia that um, you know, you'll run into if, and, and if, you, if you don't use your time as a, as a PhD student or a postdoc, to address those problems. And it's a, it's a sandbox. It, it should be fun. There's lots of different things you can work on and, and leveraging that freedom, I think is a privilege that um, we, we need to indulge as young scientists. I think we're sort of, a lot of people show up kind of uh, focused on continuing the education process yeah. and you know seeing something through at all costs, but um, it's a sandbox and you know, the next wave is going to come and, and, and knock your sandcastle over. So the key is to figure out how to ride the wave, not uh, not figure out how to finish something just for the sake of finishing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Well, let's let's pivot over to uh, our, our two truths and a lie section. I think you sent out your your answers the other day. I didn't even open the email. I wanted to be as uninformed as our audience. So um, we're going to play a game right now. Uh, a poll is going to pop up on the side of your screen if you are watching. Um, and then we're going to try to guess. Uh, which of these is, is David's lie here? Um, so I think it should pop up right now if you click on the poll. So is, is Dave a trained opera singer? Ooh. Uh, he tried to break a Peruvian transit worker's strike, or he has never taken a university-level biology course. These look hard. Hmm. All really unlikely. You did study engineering. Um, you know, I, I think I'm going to go with the biology course if I was making my... It looks like the audience is also going with the biology course. We'll leave it open uh, for a few more minutes here. And then, Dave, you can kind of inform us. Apparently, there's a significant fraction that does not think I have the chops for opera, which I'm... Or the chops to break up a transit worker strike. So <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that, but it is what it is. <laughs> if it is opera, we're going to make you sing. I, I guess if, that, if that's the truth. I mean, when you have a platform, the key is to use it to the fullest extent. So I wanted your call to arms to be vocalized in, in a soprano. <laughs> uh, OK, look, well, it looks like now people don't believe um, that. Well, it's, it's we're, we're on the fence here. Why don't we go ahead and go through them, David? I think we've contaminated the process with our commentary. <laughs> it's biasing. Do you want to go ahead and uh, let us know which is which here? Sure. Um, Yes, I am not a trained opera singer. That is, uh, yes. Although I, I do tend to break into a uh, song, typically Puccini you know, on the freeway. Um, so not trained, but yes, an opera singer. And I did try to break a Peruvian transit worker strike, which I'm not entirely proud to say, but when you're stuck on the side of a Peruvian freeway for 30 hours without food or water, you might find yourself... Uh, yeah, breaking your sense of solidarity with, with the people pretty quickly. Oh, man. And then uh, I have not taken a university level biology course. So that is that is true. Wow. Well, that is surprising, uh, to say the least. Um, well, amazing. Uh, it's been a great conversation so far. I think the next step for us is to kind of go over to the Q&A. Um, the Q&A is open for the whole audience. So if you want to ask questions of David, go ahead and put them in there. Uh, we can just open it up now and see uh, what's in there. Uh, the first question at the top with the most votes is, um, do you have any advice for aspiring biotech entrepreneurs who don't have PhDs? Yeah, I think um, the world of biotech is very much propelled by technology and ideas and um, 
there's a lot of money out there, but not enough direction. Um, and so finding kind of the technical direction is really important. So if you don't have a PhD, I think it's important to link up with somebody who has one. I mean, it takes all, all different sorts of personalities to build an organization and, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic and the structural and operational financial roles uh, are all super important to, to success. So, you know, depending on what your contribution is, you know, I think it's easy for me to talk about how important technology is because I do technology, but, you know, I have, I have a co-founder, I have a really talented team that I work with. So, um, you know, building those connections with, with, with your team, I think is generally important, whether you have a PhD or not. Yeah. It sort of occurred to me that like the, the software industry is, is ripe with folks the Mark Zuckerberg's of the world, the MIT dropouts, but no one ever talks about PhD dropouts, which are arguably much more educated people um, in, in that ecosystem. Um, yeah, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, the most famous biotech dropout is on trial right now, right? So the um, it's funny how that works. Out. I think biology is just a really, really tough, uh, like really technically tough and messy operation. Like it's just stuff that you, you can pick up a laptop and, and learn how to write some cool software, but you need just an immense amount of infrastructure and and support to be able to go through the trial and error process of, of learning biotech. So for that reason, I think having that sandbox time during a PhD is really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, next question is, without business knowledge, how did you navigate the practical is issues of business creation? I think this could be all kinds of things, financial, it could be um, just how do you work with VCs? I'd love to hear about all that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's about um, building relationships that fill the gaps in your knowledge. And I think at the beginning, the gaps in your knowledge will feel bigger than uh, your, 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 your breadth of knowledge, you know, when it comes to non-science, if you're making your way out of the PhD. But the key is just to um, be really sober and honest and with yourself about the gaps in your knowledge and find people who can help, find advisors, you know, trust your intuition. Um, I think once you absorb kind of all the dynamics, like if you look at, you know, the, the investment documents, like, you know, hundreds of pages of investment documents for, you know, an equity interaction. The sum of those terms can tell you the dynamic you're going to have with an investor or the dynamic yeah. you're going to have with a partner. So how do you soak up all that? How do you figure out what's important, what's not? I mean, it's either you have really good training or you try to soak up the info and then start playing with it, seeing how it plays out in the real world or gaming it in your head, um, just yeah. like you would if you were designing an experiment uh, as a molecular biologist. So learning the rules, learning the guardrails, and then learning how um, the game is played within those rules is the second step. Uh, David, have you turned down investment from maybe VCs or who weren't really aligned with what you wanted to do? Yeah, um, especially this time around. I mean, it's a it's a luxury that founders have, especially second time founders these days, seeing as there's lots of money available. So um, I, yeah, I think the market, you know, markets are always changing. So I think you just have to do the best thing for your company um, at that particular moment. And yeah, I did have some opportunities to make some choices about who to work with, which is which is really nice, really nice to have. And I think that's sort of the, the nature of biotech these days. It's just a lot of interest in the area. So um, feeling out kind of the different personalities that you can work with, trying to get a feel for their orientation, what they consider to be success, what they consider to be failure, what sort of role they want to have, what sort of gaps they see themselves as able to fill. Um, you know, the, your investor should be helping you build a plan as you fly it, and they shouldn't be yeah. doing anything other than that, especially at the early stages. So um, trying to get a feel for their orientation and their sensitivities and, and, you know, kind of what they consider to be success is really important. So you've kind of got a plan about how your relationship will develop from end to end. Yeah. Are you in frequent contact with those investors? Are they like scientifically aware? Are they, do you have, are they on your board? Like, how does that look? Uh, yes, to all of the above. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, every day you're, as, a, as a founder and scientist, you're dealing with kind of different problems as they arise and sort of knowing who you're, who, who in your network, you know, who's aligned with the company. And then similarly, who, um, who has the requisite skills to help you with you know, individual problems. Um, you know, know, knowing how to leverage that support is really important. And I think a lot of investors have a lot to offer when it comes yeah. to you know, early stage strategy, I think, um, and, and also like connections and resources and otherwise. So I think just knowing who can help you with what, asking people what they can help you with and using that as a basis to develop how you view the relationship is uh, something that 
is a totally normal thing to do. Like, what can you offer me? How can yeah. we build something yeah. together that's going to be successful? I mean, people want to know how to help you and giving them the opportunity um, can, can be all it takes. Next question here is, what do you think is a good industry to go into or build a startup in? And I think maybe to elaborate on that question, like if you weren't doing the work that you're doing in RNA, where would you be focusing your attention? Yeah, I mean, capitalism is a space filling gas. So if there's ever an opportunity for money to be made, um, you know, there's going to be people trying to squeeze their way in there. So the question is, what is your unique contribution? What is the thing that you know how to do better than anyone else? I mean, I'm sure this is stuff that's been said a thousand times over, but it really comes down to what differentiates you? How, how are you distinguished? How can you solve problems better than anyone else? And that's dictated by you as an individual, not by the specific industry. So, I mean, having spent many years grinding my gears over problems in RNA biology and gene therapy, that turned out to be an area where I could distinguish myself and that's where I continue to operate. But, um, you know, educating myself on the side about areas that I find exciting, like delivery and otherwise, kind of um, sets the basis for a pivot in my career down the road. But, you know, I don't, I don't presume that I can show up and solve all the problems that lots of others have been dealing with without, you know, a lot of uh, consideration and thinking and strategizing, you know, just the same amount of effort net that went into this current effort I'm building. Um, maybe one more about kind of the business element here. It's uh, what are the challenges that you face with sort of your first two, three, four hires? Um, I assume at Locana, you kind of went into a, a direct manager role, but maybe you can kind of uh, uh, talk about what happened there as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's really easy to get excited about kind of specific problems and specific techniques and um, hire, make those early hires based on, you know, execution of those techniques or solutions to those problems. But the problem is things just change so quickly. And the fact is that you don't have that many uh, FTEs in the early stages such that the pivots always occur. But even if like you're working the same basic thing, the means by which you get there can change so quickly. It's really important to be working with, again, like really flexible and people just really flexible and just have a really high level of raw intelligence so they can kind of roll with the punches. Um, I think that's kind of the most important thing. So flexibility is, is key and it's hard to assess flexibility. I mean, what appears to be flexibility can also be like um, inability to focus. But, mm -hmm. um, but that said, having somebody who's accomplished in multiple areas or at least picked up techniques in multiple areas, I think is a good indication of flexibility. Yeah, yeah, totally. Here's a science one for you from, from Trent. Uh, what challenges have you seen in the, de in the delivery space? Um, and what do you think is the most promising? He mentions AAV, AAV-like particles, virus-like particles, uh, lipid nanoparticles, naked RNA, et cetera. So maybe just a little bit about the science again here. Yeah, I'm excited about sort of hybrid approaches that leverage some of the uh, inherent features of AAV, for instance. So, so the durability of AAV is great. You get it inside of a cell. It stabilizes, can, can catamerizes. The DNA can generate therapeutic for a long time, maybe indefinitely in non-dividing cells. Really exciting. But then you've got this viral capsid. So sort of separating the vi like the immunogenic uh, viral features of uh, delivery vectors from kind of the durability and kind of unique malbio that occurs once the payload's inside the cell. Like taking the best of both, like the best of LMPs and the best of viral, viral systems, putting them together, I think is a really cool thing. So Generation Bio is doing something like this, um, using these AAV-like genomes to uh, and package them in LMPs and use that as a basis to get or get non-viral but durable um, gene expression. Yeah. So, um, I mean, v anything involving immunogenic proteins has its idiosyncrasies. I mean, VLPs can be cool because they could be new to the human immune system but still tough to redose. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's sort of, I, I think a lot about immunogenicity and non-immunogenicity in the case of viral systems is super important. Yeah. Um, maybe one more on the science here is just where do you see the future of RNA therapies going? I think eventually we'll have, uh, a means to generate arbitrary changes to RNA. Um, so we'll be able to reverse individual, uh, like SNPs. So, so mutations in individual bases. We'll be able to re replace large sequences. We'll be able to uh, add large sequences to RNA. Um, and that's something that is very much on the horizon and something that we are working on over here. And once we sort of have that durable ability to deliver material and then generate arbitrary changes to nucleic acids or RNA specifically, we'll have a means to address um, many diseases that are currently not addressable for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
A few more questions here, Dave. Uh, when it comes to meetings with potential investors, do you give them all of your data about the research and the business idea, or do you keep some of that uh, to yourself? Like, what do you? How does that meeting look? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're telling a story um, whenever you give a pitch, and this and the, the story, like the, the plot points, are the data you've collected. So it's important to make sure that the message you're trying to send is connected to the data and is also you know credible in your mind. Like you don't want to uh you know walk up into a situation that you can't uh can't walk out of i mean it's very important to make sure that you make promises that you think are achievable i mean one way to do this is sort of dump all the data out there and say okay you guys make something up this but another way is to come up with a story and a path that you think is credible and use the data to support that and um so so no, i don't typically and it pitches you know maybe it could be five slides could be 20 slides i mean you should have hopefully more data than that uh, you know in your back pocket and attention human attention spans are definitely a limiting factor um i mean when you when you give a pitch to somebody from the from a tech background they want to see five slides and it, and it should be done in less than 10 minutes but um in biotech i think it takes longer there's more detail there's more explanation there's fewer kind of uh accepted uh model description m models to describe the activity of your approach so it, i think the science requires a bit more deliberation but that said it's important to keep it focused yeah uh, question from Anna Lee here that I'm going to tee up. My marketing team will be happy. Um, how has your partnership with Benchling impacted Stealth Mode's workflow? Um, and, and maybe also uh, kind of your use at Lacana. Yeah. So, I mean, Benchling is really cool because um, it allows me to uh, main some, maintain some basal level of organization and then the system kind of takes care of everything else. So like Gmail, I can sort of search for what I need. But here we've linked not just messages, but, you know, data entries and inventory items and, um, you know, bits of data, like if, you, if you're curious as to what this specific object, um, what data it's generated and, you know, where it is in your lab and what the data looks like, and it's all, you know, a couple clicks away. It's really nice because it gives everyone in the organization, you know, really convenient means to, um, to communicate and not waste any time reinventing any wheels. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to keep all of your data top of mind, but ideally you do and use that to make the decisions. But when it's not, it's, it's really easy to find stuff within the system at Benchling. So it's been, it's been, I think, I think it's unique in that respect. Yeah. It's good to hear our search team. will be happy to hear that as well. Um, they work a lot on making things easy to find. Um, maybe, maybe one more question here, Dave. Um, it, we sort of answered it, but uh, what advice do you have for postgrads that want to work for biotech startups? Um, do you value their research skills more or their lab skills more? Uh, maybe also a good time to ask if stealth mode is hiring um, right now. And yes, yes. Well, stealth mode biotech, is indeed hiring so um please reach out to me i think my twitter handle's up there um i guess that's one convenient way to do it um but yeah when you're looking for jobs in biotech i think um plan to be embedded in a team that's trying to solve a really tough problem and so um, people look for your level of sensitivity and um flexibility when it comes to working closely with team members um i think there are so many jobs out there that are they're currently unfilled so not the, not nearly not not a company's nearly as cool as mine but like <laughs> a lot of jobs out there and and so i think it's a great time to be looking for a job um i think the key is just to get out there and and start applying and have like really sober conversations with potential um employers about what your job might look like um i think it's tough to know precisely what the science is about because a lot of people are very secretive about what they're up to myself included yeah. but you can get a feel for kind of like the structural and kind of softer side of things and who you'd be working with and what those interactions will look like and um so applying for jobs and and you know treating interviews as kind of a two-way street i think is a good way to begin the process and um yeah a lot of jobs out there these days all right well you heard it here uh find david on twitter uh, apply to Stealth Mode Bio. David, I was going to let you off the hook at that question, but there's one more that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, sure. Lessons learned uh, in starting Locana versus this new one. Um, you know, what are what have you improved the most on? What have you done differently that's been notable? Yeah, I think the early stages are very tight in terms of resources and also what you need to accomplish. So even before I spoke to anybody about what we're doing, I, I laid out a detailed plan, like month by month plan yeah. as to what yeah. we need to accomplish and to whom these different uh, milestones will mean something and what it will mean and then how that relates to you know, corporate development. And that's something that, you know, having seen the process once, um, it made it much easier to do. And I was, you know, I think it's really tough to imagine how people think when it comes to VCs or big pharma and potential partners or what have you. It's really hard to know how they think until you spend a lot of time 
talking to them and bouncing ideas and seeing what they get excited about. But on um, that said, you can you can do that anytime. I think there's a huge amount of interest these days in, in academic science. So there's always opportunities to have these conversations. So kind of laying anyway, laying out end to end um, what the solutions will be and what the milestones are um, in the first half decade um, in a really sober, realistic, but uh, kind of perspicuous way, I think was the most important thing for this new operation. All right. Well, thank you, David. Um, I really appreciated the conversation today. Um, it's really invigorating. Um, before we wrap up today's episode, um, I did want to take a moment to kind of tease uh, next month's episode. Um, so next month on Founders Chat, we'll be talking to Tammy Sue of Hugh Bio. Uh, she'll be joining us on May 19th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, Tammy is currently the CSO at, at Hugh. He was a, a company making um, sustainable dyes. And so they're starting with sustainable indigo, um, doing that with, with some strain development, strain engineering. Um, and from her work that spun out of UC Berkeley, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation, um, talking a bit about biotech, a bit about biotech at the convergence of like the fashion industry, um, and then some sustainability from a, a female founder. Uh, so we would love for you all to attend uh, on May 19th. And, and we're certainly um, looking forward to that episode with Tammy. Um, and then lastly, David, thank you so much again. Um, we really appreciated your time today. I hope that everybody found that um, to be informative. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Benchling, you can go to benchling.com slash startups. Um, if you're founding a company, you should start with us. Um, you can follow Dave on Twitter. Um, Dave is only a little bit active on Twitter, but you should definitely go into his messages and try to work at Stealth Mode Biotech. And then finally, thank you so much to our sponsor, uh, Quartzy. Um, and you can you can look at Quartzy to help improve your lab, your operational efficiency, um, sort of your ordering, your inventory tracking. So um, feel free to visit them as well. And thanks so much for sponsoring Quartzy. Um, everyone have a great rest of your week.